Welcome to the Adapt or Die podcast. This podcast explores ideas related to self-growth, finding meaning, and living a more fulfilled lifestyle. It's your host, with the most, Armel Tala. And it's your host, on the low, Ben Smith. We're two college students on our own path of lifelong learning with the hope that you will join us in our journey. And now, it's time for the next episode of the Adapt or Die podcast. Welcome back to the last episode of 12 Rules for Life, number four, a whole month's worth of just really life impacting rules, in my opinion. What are your thoughts, Ben, now that we're on the last episode? I think the, uh, well, I think Rule 11 is kind of, eh, but I think Rule 10 is, Rule 10 is a really good rule. It's, it's going to hit y'all hard if, hopefully it hits y'all hard, like it hit us hard, but. Oh, yeah, no, Rule 10, Rule, t- like, it's like all of the rules last episode, probably one of the rules from the episode number two, like, those string together, like, he just had, like, it was yeah. five rules just really just. Wow. He just went in. I was like, yo, chill. I'm not going to lie. The last two rules, they hit you and like, you know, he's solid uh, advice he's giving, but the title of the rules just don't make any sense. Yeah, they're not that like relevant to the actual rules themselves, to be honest. But, but with that being said, make sure y'all grab 12 Rules for Life. 12 Rules for Life. I always feel like I mess up the 12 by Jordan Peterson. We're on the last three rules. Thank you guys for sticking around. Make sure you like, subscribe, uh, share with a friend. Check out the socials down below. With all that being said, number 10, be precise in your speech. Before I jump in, I would like to make a disclaimer. I'm recovering from sickness, so if my voice sounds a little odd, that is being that is why. Um, but anyways, rule number 10, be precise in your speech. Um, so one thing, if you've read the Bible, uh, or if you're familiar with the Bible at all, um, one thing that you know is that it says that God spoke the world into being. Um, the the r- phrase is, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Um, that's another ev- like instance of language and speaking being used uh, at the beginning of the world. And so it's interesting that the Bible would use speech and language um, to bring the world into creation. Uh, and it's, very, it's a very important point like why wouldn't god build the world why wouldn't god snap his fingers to create the world why wouldn't god just let the world be why did he have to speak it into the world a simple answer well not actually simple let's rephrase <laughs> that but a straightforward answer in my opinion is um and then obviously what jordan peterson said is we don't we see the world implicitly so Meaning we don't see the world for literally what it is, explicitly what is in front of us, but we see it in an implicit sense in how does it um, help us achieve some type of goal. Or we see the minimum necessary information to gain use from an object. An example is like when you're looking at a table, you don't see a slab of wood with four legs. That's not what you see. You don't interpret that way. What you see is just the table itself. And the thing is, you don't even see the table most of the time. You identify it as a table, but what you really see is a place to eat. And so we sense the meaning of everything, but we often can't articulate it. And aren't unarticulated things aren't real in some sense. And they're real in the way that we sense their meaning. Like we understand, like if something feels off, we sense that something is off, but we don't have the if we don't have the ability to describe them they're not really real right they're just a sense of feeling and language is how we organize the chaos of understanding the world without language we cannot create order out of the abundantly complex world and an example would be marriage um with relationships so you and your partner are going through something and you guys sense that there's something wrong um both of you can feel it uh there's you know that tension in the room and everything, and you understand that the current state of your relationship is not where it's supposed to be. But to understand what's wrong, you and your partner have to talk about it. And at first, um, the issue seems hazy, foggy, and you're like, okay, well, you start to talk, and you guys are talking about all these different problems, but with through more and more articulation, more and more just repetition, repetition, geez, I can't, repetition, talking, and just getting to really try to 
aim, pinpoint the problem, it starts to become a single issue. You start to really identify the core problem it is. And once it's identified, the issue can be corrected. And it's upon, it's only upon articulating the issue that it can be fixed. Until then, the issue continues to manifest. So going back to the original question, um, Mel like already answered it really, but um, to really just clarify, um, why did God speak the world into existence? Um, it's because language and speech is how we understand the world. To understand the world, we must articulate it, and that is what, in some sense, gives it existence in our consciousness, right? Um, and so, like in the marriage example, uh, by articulating the problem, by turning it to that, from that hazy fog into some finite point, um, that is only done through speech, through language. That is the actual um, taking the chaos of implicit meaning and turning it into the order of true understanding through language. And when you do that, that allows you to assess something and truly fix the issue and, and really change something about the world. And I think one thing you to add was you're saying again just to i just like the way you phrased this was language takes chaos of implicit meaning and turns it into order of true understanding that is really the power of language but more importantly like why do we fear articulating the problem what what is our fear with speech and our fear with speech is closely related to life lies can you explain to those that maybe just are now listening what our life lies been yeah life lies are basically um it's small lies that we tell ourselves to uh, manipulate reality, basically, in a sense, you know, like you think you know better, you know, you think you want something out of reality, um, so you try to manipulate it in some way. It's just like a little white lie um, that, you know, quote unquote, no one will know, but it's actually creates like a different paradigm and then it's a life lie, basically. And so in that sense, when you are living in a life lie, you're not articulating the truth. You're not really articulating the real problem. And we don't want to admit that there's something wrong because we don't want to understand what's wrong a lot of the times. And we live in, we kind of live in the dark. And even though it seems that the dark and not understanding what is wrong is not that bad, it's better than facing the problem. The unknown is far scarier than what is known. And once we understand the true issue, it will hurt painfully to know what it is, right? Uh, and the way you can think about this is we don't want to confront our fears a lot of times, but you must confront your fears, truly seek understanding and articulate the problems. And an, an unarticulated issue can never be resolved. We, t we tend to trade like short-term peace and stability for long-term peace and stability. And this in itself obviously is not good because once you keep avoiding the short-term problems, they build and build on each other and then they compound to something so large that we cannot avoid it. I would like to make one correction when I said the life lies. Life lies are also, they can be much larger scale as well. Um, they're just, they often manifest as like smaller lies that you tell yourself, but there's often some underlying like deeper belief and that creates the life lie. So it could be, um, you believe like a political ideology that uh, would fix the world, but it's actually like a, it, it has like some small like token of something that's not true. And um, that actually creates a life lie because you're trying to bend reality to, make it conform to your idea of how it should be, but it's not actually how it should be. Um, and how does these life lies and our fear of speech connect to like our goals and us not really identifying them? For sure. Um, speech is, speech is integral to your goals. Um, you, you need to, you, you have to specify your goals if you want to achieve them. Um, just on a, like a, just a basic level, like if you don't specify where you want to go, how are you ever going to get there? Right? Like that's, that's not going to happen. You know, like if you don't specify what it is that you want, you won't get it. It's not going to fall into your lap. The world doesn't just gift you things out of nowhere. Um, that that's just never going to happen. Um, but why don't we specify our goals? Uh, he says this so elegantly, um, to specify our goals is to specify conditions for failure. Uh, it is only once we know what we want that we know what it is that we don't want, right? But to specify our conditions for failure means that we can actually fail. So what a lot of us do, and instead of specifying our goals, which are conditions for failure at the same time, we just don't specify anything. Um, and that allows us to not fail because we don't have anything 
to fail against, right? Um, the problem is, at some point, maybe a decade or two decades later, um, you can easily fail so bad, even though you have nothing else, even though you have no goal, uh, your life will be so miserable that you will realize that you failed so bad that you you will just existentially suffer. And he says this, like, that can easily happen by the time you're 35 or 40 if you don't specify and have some goals. So um, you can not develop goals, but uh, it will not work out for you in the end. I, I can, I'm pretty sure, I'm almost positive about that. So you, we, we can add to that? Mm-mm, I have nothing else to say besides. Okay. Um, I guess I'm going to keep going. There's, there's one more, a couple more things on here. Um, but he, you know, he says, stop hiding from the unknown. You need to articulate your life. Okay. It's, it's difficult. It's hard to bring light into the darkness. It's a, it's a hard process. It's painful. Um, but it's what you need to do. Uh, one quote he says is say what you mean so that you can find out what you mean, act out what you say. So you can, so you can find out what happens Then pay attention, know your errors, articulate them strive to correct them that is how you discover the meaning of your life so be precise in your speech precise in your goals that is how you order the chaos of the world and you move and progress in life which creates meaning and wow with that we go on to the rules that the titles are a bit unclear (laughs) to To say the least to say the least but number 11 rule 11 chapter 11 do not bother children when they are skateboarding. And this is an interesting chapter. Uh, it's probably the more controversial chapter of the book. I didn't understand why people had an odd feeling about the book as I was reading up. I could sense, but then this is the chapter where it really like, okay, I can see where ideas and people's views can conflict. And the main topic is masculinity, but he explores it in different ways. And it's also packed with a lot of information. So there's just... He goes in so many different tangents that we couldn't really like say all of them or it would be a whole, you know, hour in itself. Yeah. But um yeah, most of the controversial stuff is really related to the gender and the state of uh, masculinity in the US right now. So the first thing that he talks about is hierarchies. And so um he gets his home, he's so clear on this. You can even in his lectures, um he hierarchies uh are natural and, and any hierarchy um will create winners and losers. Uh, of course, the winners will try to uphold the hierarchy because they're winners and, and losers are more likely um, to try to break it down because, of course, um, they're losers in the hierarchy. Um, but why are hierarchies natural, according to Peterson? Well, he gives two reasons. Um, collective pursuit of any valued goal will produce a hierarchy, um, naturally just because some people will be better at attaining that goal than others due to natural variance in genetics, you know, intelligence or you know whatever it is that that separates us right and then um the second thing is pursuit of goals uh in large part lends life um it's sustaining meaning okay so what he's saying there is that we need to be pursuing something um to have meaning in life and so if we don't have something to pursue we're actually taking the meaning out of life and we, we need that and so if we take away any valued goal uh, to therefore take away the hierarchy, um, we're actually going to take away the meaning in life um, by, as, as a consequence, right? Uh, one thing he also says is um, communism is a quality of outcome. That's kind of what it tries to do, right? Uh, but it sacrifices value, as, we just, as I kind of just alluded to. So if everything is equal, um, you're trying to take away the value of everything so no one can move. Like there's nothing to attain right because nothing's more valuable than anything else and again that that removes the meaning of life but also you know removes the hierarchy but it removes the meaning as well so hierarchies are natural that was kind of his main point there (laughs) sorry i went on a tangent peterson says that you know you don't have to like hierarchies like he's not trying to make you accept or he's not trying to make you be like you know what i just am perfectly fine with these hierarchies but what he's saying is hierarchies are natural law And it's just best to accept the truth. And I just resonate with this is you could try to fix the unfixable. You could try to control what you can't control or you could focus on what you can. And Peterson thinks uh, this the way this certain way of viewing hierarchies is false and a dangerous belief. And that belief is 
that a hierarchical society of the West is based on power and aimed at exclusion. And embedded it, and embedded in this idea is that hierarchies are thus created and not naturally occurring, right? And this is dangerous to look at because you're saying that there's a certain group of people that are trying to exclude. Like it's a it's a hierarchy that was particularly created to hurt or you know downplay certain people, right? But Western culture is actually predicated on uh, predicated in competence, ability, and skill. Like so, for evidence, and I'm gonna quote Peterson here: the most valid personality trait trait pred- can't ever talk. The most valid personality trait predictors of long-term success in Western countries are intelligence, as measured with cognitive ability or IQ tests and conscientious, conscientiousness. And that's a trait characterized by industrious industriousness and orderliness. And he, another thing he adds about conscientiousness, conscientiousness is that usually people that have that trait are you know, high integrity, um, and they you know, when they when they say they're going to do something, they usually will. And but want to say that Peterson isn't rejecting the idea that motive, um, that power is a motivation for certain people, but he's saying that that is not the motivation. That is not the only motivation, but it's very dangerous. Like you might ask, why is it dangerous to believe our society is based on power and aimed at exclusion? And it's because one, it's, it's simple, but it's not true. Right. And in life, we want to be seeking the truth. We want to be on the pursuit for truth. And two is like I mentioned earlier, it suggests that hierarchies are a social construct used by a small group of people to gain by putting down other groups of people. And if you view it this way, you're viewing the world in a zero sum game. And that is not what you want. The way we want to think about things is a, you know, positive sum game where instead of instead of us saying like there's only a certain amount of pie to be shared, we can grow the pie and thus everybody's piece of it becomes larger. Can it be pecan pie? I really like pecan pie. No, I hate all pie. I wish I don't even like. I don't know <laughs> what analogy I would use. And maybe it's like Chick Fil. To me, it'd be like you know maybe some Chick Fil A nuggets. You know, there's a certain amount we can divide it. But if what if we just got more nuggets, right? So everyone can have more nuggets. Do you like cookie cake? I'm not a fan of Chick Fil A like that. Anyway, I'll let you keep going. My bad. I didn't mean to interrupt. No cookie cake. I mean cookie cake is cool. All right, but so it's cool. Never mind. Never mind. But so, and if you view. If you view that society is based on power and aim to aim at exclusion, then you're gonna believe that um, you're gonna believe that the solution is equal equal outcome. And like we like we mentioned before, that has terrible consequences. Evidence is communism, and the result is tyranny, and millions of people die. As evidenced by um, Mao's China, USSR, and um, a few other countries, but ma- mainly those two. Uh, now, another really dangerous belief that he warns against. Um, is the idea that our Western culture and society was created through male oppression. Um, he, he completely rejects um, this idea uh, that the co- like culture um, is or could be created by men. Okay? He's very strong about this. He, he wants people to know very strongly that these are very dangerous ideas. Okay? Um, you might be asking, though, because this is a pretty pervasive idea, um, idea in our culture that, like, you know, male oppression has kind of created the society, the patriarchy um, that we have today, and that's why we see the structure the way it is. Um, but you might ask, if that's not true, according to Peterson, what is his alternative theory? Um, well, he thinks that, uh, you know, men, have str- men and women alike um, have struggled together for millennia to kind of rid themselves of the dangers um, and the, the privation and, and all of that within nature, right? They're trying to um, distance themselves from the danger within uh, the unknown, right? It just so happens that women are more disadvantaged in a lot of ways, um, not a lot of ways, but some ways, because uh, they have all of the vulnerabilities of men, uh, but they also have uh, an extra reproductive burden. Uh, they have less physical strength. Um, they have serious practical inconvenience of menstruation, uh, the high probability of unwanted pregnancy, the chance of death or a serious injury during childbirth, and the burden of too many young children. Okay, so well, I'll just, instead of explaining all that, I'll actually read a quote because he explains it pretty well um, in terms of what he believes. He says, perhaps that is sufficient reason for the different legal and practical treatment of men and women that characterized most societies prior to the recent technological revolutions. At least such things might be taken into account before the assumption that men tyrannized women is accepted as a truism. Can I add um, one? 
we're again articulating Peterson's view. Yes. Um, and I want to also add that it would enhance some if you think about it. Be because we've advanced so far with technology, because we are able to have amazing medicine and not have to worry about certain of the things that we've worried about before, that it's finally freed us and allowed us to view those issues. And I, you're going to mention this, that the development of patriarchy was not, it's not the best solution, but it was at the time what they thought to be the best to keep um, society structured, right? And with that limitation, they were just limited by their, the technology they had and certain things they could do. But now that we have technology, we've actually we've, we've been able to free ourselves to actually now just start rethinking the structure of our society and try to make it more fair and equal. If that makes more sense. Absolutely, and, and you're absolutely right in that. Like what not and what he was trying to say um, about the development of the patriarchy. He doesn't think it was. It's it, it wasn't like uh, like men just colluded together and they're like, hey guys. You know our wives, the people we love like the most? Yeah, how about we just make all the women in our civilization like less than us and then we can rule the world and like, you know, he's not like, he's, what he's basically, you know, I was exaggerating there obviously, but what he was saying, what his point is, is that um, it wasn't a purposeful putting down of women that the patriarchy developed. Uh, it was more of, all right, we have these jobs that people need to go do, all right? Who is the natural um, caretaker for kids? It's, it's not like, you know, it's a bad job. It's just who is the natural person to do that? For most, it's women because they're the child, you know, they um, give birth to the child, they breastfeed, they are natural caregivers. They're actually better at it than most men, I would say. I mean, that's pretty scientifically proven, right? So then that leaves men who don't have a reproductive burden. Um, they go out and they, you know, they have to go build things and, and make civilization. And that's kind of how the patriarchy develops, right? Um, and that's, that's his point. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but that is the angle that he's going for. Um, and he, he says that it's very dangerous to kind of assume that the patriarchy was developed just through male oppression um, of women uh, because then it, it creates issues because it, it creates a society that de facto treats men um, as oppressors. And it also leaves a lot of men feeling uh, that their place in society um, is unearned and that whatever they do, they feel guilty about it because uh, for them to get somewhere, they must have taken it from someone else, specifically women. Um, and that yeah. is the view of looking at the world as a zero-sum game. Remember, we can have a positive-sum society, and I think he says the best societies are those that everyone can win, and we try to not just... We don't take from each other, but we help each other grow what everyone can get. But with that being said, that was number 11. Again, those views, we we're just rearticulating what Jordan Peterson said in the book. Um, how you decide to take that is your own. On to number 12, a bit more friendlier title. I mean, even the last one was friendly. It was like, you know, don't bother children when they're skateboarding. And you guys probably like, how does that relate to don't bother children? We don't have time to explain it, to be honest. Maybe in the discussion. Yeah, but number 12 is pet a cat when you encounter one on the street. For those dog lovers, he says he has a dog. You can pet a dog, too. He's not trying to, you know, exclude dogs. But life is suffering. At this point, you've heard me say this. Um, I think Ben's given me every single section that, it, that has to do with life is suffering. You're more upbeat than I am. This is truly, truly is just, I mean, what Buddha said it and everything. But we all know this. And Peterson talks a lot about his daughter, Michaela, who developed juvenile arthritis. And she suffered from what I read pretty severely but the point is nothing puts your faith um your faith to the test than seeing a child just suffering an, an innocent child at that seriously suffering through arthritis things that we think only old people would get right and so this makes peterson wonder why are humans so fragile and how can we deal with the suffering of life so for the first question um why are we fragile uh and, and his answer you know why are humans fragile um comes to um, limitations are, are part of who we are as human uh, so peterson recognizes um the fragility specifically in his three-year-old son and he kind of does a, a thought experiment he, he wonders what could or would he do if he could um to kind of fortify his son to make him almost invulnerable right um and this is what he says, this is a direct quote. He says, uh, he could be 20 feet tall instead of 40 inches. Nobody could push him over then. 
he could be made of titanium instead of flesh and bone. Then if some brat bounced a toy truck off his noggin, he wouldn't care. He would have a computer-enhanced brain, and even if he was damaged, somehow his parts could be immediately replaced. The problem with that, though, um, as Peterson says, is if he did that to his son, if his son was had all those capabilities, that wouldn't be Peterson's three-year-old son. That would just be a robot, right? So to fortify his son with such gifts would actually take away what it means for his son to be human. Part of what it means to be human is to have limitations, right? Our limitations are what make us human. They're what make us lovable. They're what make us us. And with that, if you're thinking about, I guess, going back to kind of big, biblical references and the creation of man, another way to kind of look at humans' fragility is from the perspective of God himself. What does, can you say this for me? Because I don't, I'm not, I can't, um, it's I, I got omnipresent. You. It's, uh, omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent. Omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent being lack. And that's limitations. And so thus, what Peterson um, states is that God created us for the, for the fact that he wanted a form of himself, right? Because we were made in the eye, at least from the view of Christians and anybody that believes in God, we were made from, um, we were made to imitate we are made in the image of in God. The image of God. Yeah. So we're made in the image of God, but he gave he but he made us have limitations and all that. I mean, after we ate the apple, obviously. So the story goes, we were created for our limitations, not in spite of it. Now, so we kind of gave a, an answer to um, why are humans fragile? And, and I, I think to some extent that that answer uh it does grasp at straws for me a little bit. I don't know if I fully agree with it, but we'll talk about that in discussion. The second question, though, um, I think he, he really he really hits this well. How do we deal with the suffering of life? Um, and one really practical thing that I never even really thought about was, he says, alter your time horizon. So when life is good, uh, make sure you plan for the future. Um, so you know, save adequately, maybe even a little excessively. Um, you know rainy days are, are ahead, right? When life is at its best, um, you know, we talked about this regression to the mean. It's a good chance that bad things are going to come, not soon, but eventually, right? Um, so it's also very easy to think long-term when life is good. Uh, but when life is difficult, um, sometimes just the moment is so overwhelming that that's all you can handle, right? Sometimes you can't think more than a week ahead or even to tomorrow or maybe not even for the next hour or minute, maybe this second is all you can handle and that's okay um if you are suffering if you're going through something that's that difficult um, and there are a lot of things in this world that are that difficult um, because as mel put it earlier life is suffering um, shorten your time horizon just focus on the maximum amount of time that you can think about getting through safely and and just use that as your target so if that's a second that's okay if it's an hour like better right but just use that, and that will help you get through. Um, and, and then also while you're doing that, this is kind of where the, the rule comes in. He says, um, pet, a, pet a cat or pet a dog. And what that really means is uh, try to find the silver lining and, and be grateful for what you have. Try to find the good things in life. Try to find the things that are still, that still make life worth living, um, even in spite of your suffering. Uh, this definitely won't cure your suffering, but... He says, and instead of making your suffering a hell by compounding your, um, you know, by making it worse, uh, maybe you can just keep it a tragedy. And I thought that was an interesting line. But yeah, mm, it's like I think it's very interesting this whole book that it's more like, yeah, life is gonna suck, but what are you gonna do about it, right? Um, so you want to aim for the good and focus on today, and this means really like be cautious of just tr purely living in the moment. It is good to live in a moment, but not having a care for tomorrow will result in just, again, unpreparedness for that tragedy that might occur because you had time to prepare from the quote last time. That is a sin. But so proper, proper orientation means having an ultimate goal for your being, and you should assume the goodness of being and focus on alleviating suffering and I don't think we ever actually touched on what 
Jordan Peterson says being is. But for me, I mean, you can give your take. It's like just your soul. It's your existence. It's your, it's like your consciousness. I honestly don't know. Like I, I'm not even sure. Like from his, I don't know if he ever specifically commented on it. He, he kind of just. It's almost as if he takes being as like a presupposition or like just a, just is like just, it's just there. Being is, being is just here. It's not. It's you know being alive. It's being aware of the fact you are alive. But with that being said, he's saying that you want. This the fact that you're conscious and alive. You want to aim it towards an ultimate goal, and you should assume that you should assume that your being, your life. I guess what he's trying to say here is that there's goodness in it, right? There's good in you, and in that goal, you should try to find some goodness and focus on allevi- alleviating suffer as you're heading towards that good, um, good and ultimate goal. But I like the way ben <clears throat> I like the way Ben put this. He says. I mean, where you're quoting Ben, bruh. <laughs> he says, create, <clears throat> why am I having a hard time speaking? Create the macro, live out the micro that aligns with the macro. Say that betterly. Better. <laughs> I said betterly. <laughs> create the macro, live out the micro that aligns with the macro. So really meaning that have a goal, a whole um, long-term vision, but each day you should be taking the necessary steps to, you know, achieve that long-term vision while making sure you're focusing in the present that being said i wanted to kind of tie back to 11 real quick Mm -hmm. rule 11 to make it make sense i guess to what the rule is so the rule was do um do not bother children when they're skateboarding and we hit a lot about you know the hierarchies and how society is based on competence and we shouldn't view um society as just like ultimately that patriarchy was planned and everything but The way Peterson ties this idea, at least from what I heard from his lectures, was that people that bother children when they're skateboarding, they're ruining what is, I guess, good. They're kind of ruining, like, when children are skateboarding, they are, one, doing something that either you think is, like, really dumb, you know, sometimes they're not wearing protective gear, um, but they're doing it courageously. They're brave about it, and they're going to learn from that mistake. And when someone bothers them, when someone stops them from... um, skateboarding what you're doing is you're ruining something that was good for those kids right and his whole rant on like how we view society and hierarchies and what um our view of patriarchy is that while these are not the best like while children that are skateboarding don't always make the best decision of wearing their helmet they don't know you know sometimes they should they shouldn't and it's like the in a tie to patriarchy is that patriarchy is not the best solution we all know this. That's why we want to fix it. But it was a solution that came to be, and it brought our society so much good. And I don't even want to say patriarchy itself, but just the way society is structured, and especially when you're looking at the West. Um, so what he is saying, again, want to really articulate this is his belief. What he is saying is that we shouldn't try to view what, how we came up to be as bad, but we should try to view for what it is and then try to fix those things moving forward. I hope that kind of ties in what the rule is. Don't bother children when they're skateboarding to his whole rant. But again, I really want to preface that these are his views that I'm articulating, not my own. My own views are for only people that I know to know. <laughs> One thing that he said that um, I, I think is actually a really good point. Uh, as far as Western society goes, um, is, is our society built in an ideal manner? No, it is not, right? There are definitely things we could fix, absolutely. But compared to every other civilization that we've ever looked at, um, is there any other civilization that you could say is um, as equal or as beneficial or I, I don't know, the standard of living as good as there is in the West? And I mean, I don't know one. I think the answer is no. And if there is one, I, I doubt it's greater, if not, you know, only equal, right? So at, at some level, like we do need to be grateful for the obvious inadequacies in our society, but it has also provided some very good things um, in the sense that we still have the ability to, um, you know, be free in our speech and, and, and really push forward new ideas that we think we can use to better culture and society. So. And I think the last thing to add to that is I don't believe that, you know, patriarch, like pay, society should not go on as, you know, 
is only male or only male at the top or things like that. It should if everyone should have equal opportunity, right? But if we lie to ourselves about how things came to be, we won't come to a real solution. We'll only be fixing an imaginary problem, right? So right. we want to be real about things to make sure that we're actually coming to a real solution um, to help improve society for everybody. So that is the last point. Uh, and with that being said, apparently, I didn't read this part because once I got to the conclusion, 12, I was like, it's done. But Ben says the coda of this book. I don't even know what coda means. I don't know what coda means either, but I assume I it's some like... Code to live by? Some, maybe it's Latin for conclusion or something. I don't know. Mm, maybe. I, it's, it seems like some Greek... I don't know what kind of word it is. Who knows? But go off, anyways, he's, he has a lot... <laughs> <laughs> Get your ass. Uh, okay, so I'm just going to read um, some quotes uh, he has um, in the coda. I think they're... I found them quite moving. Um, this won't take too long, but I thought they're pretty interesting. Um, a lot of it's a it's a question and answer format. So, he um here it goes. What shall I do when I despise what I have? Remember those who have nothing and strive to be grateful. What shall I do when greed consumes me? Remember that it is truly better to give than to receive. What shall I do with a lying man? Let him speak so that he may reveal himself. What shall I do with a fallen soul? Offer a genuine and cautious hand, but do not join it in the mire. What shall I do with the stranger? Invite him into my house and treat him like a brother, so that may, he may become one. What shall I do to strengthen my spirit? Do not tell lies or do what you despise. What shall I do with the most difficult of questions? Consider them the gateway to the path of life. What shall I do tomorrow? the most good possible in the shortest period of time. What shall I do next year? Try to ensure that the good I do then will be exceeded only by the good I do the year after that. What shall I do with my life? Aim for paradise and concentrate on today. What shall I do for God my Father? Sacrifice everything I hold dear to yet greater perfection. So mm. there's some quotes. Uh, if you, it's about, it's only like 15 pages, so you should read it, Mel. Um, <laughs> But anyways, yeah, that was 12 Rules for Life, guys. I hope this really impacted y'all as much as it impacted us. But we'll talk about more um, in the discussion about how it impacted us. You can listen to that right after you finish this episode because they drop on the same day. Wink, Later. Wink. Same week. Sa oh, same, same week? Same week. Just oh, okay, my later bad. In the day. He, he, he controls the drops. I don't know. Yeah, same week later in the day. Um, I don't have much of a way to tie in all these rules together as the other ones. But... Do you want to recap? Yeah, I can recap real quick. Um, so rule 10, be precise in your speech. It's so important to articulate what it is um, that articulate issues in the world because it's only through articulating them that you can understand them and then solve them. And then also articulate your goals because you can't hit what you cannot specify or what you haven't specified. That's never going to happen. Um, rule 11, uh, don't bother kids when they are skateboarding. Um, maybe question the... Uh, given societal structure that, or the given way that people portray uh, how our society um, has come to be the way it is. I'm not saying it is one way or another, um, but Peterson offers some interesting ideas on how it came to be, and if he's right, um, he does have some valid points on how it could be dangerous to believe um, other beliefs. Then 12, the last one, um, life is suffering, and that's really hard. Uh, if you are struggling with the moment, just focus on the moment and, and get through today and try to be grateful for what you have. And in the end, um, his overall thing is uh, aim for the most good possible and to alleviate suffering. As he says, aim for paradise and concentrate on today. And that is how you should orient your life. That is 12 rules for life. And now it's from my favorite part of the episode, a quote from Armelicus Milius. All right. I think this quote kind of encapsulates almost everything that this book talks about and this is pulled from number 11 uh, no rule number 10 and to quote jordan peterson why refuse to investigate when knowledge of reality enabled master mastery of reality i want to repeat because i like that so much why refuse to investigate when knowledge of reality enabled master of reality mastery of reality so yeah powerful stuff my quote reading skills, I've been off. I think it's because Ben's been looking at me, bro. 
with all that being said though with the choppiness of the end thank you guys so much for listening make sure you guys like subscribe and till next time peace